All right, PAS Report listeners, the holiday season is here. Why not make your life easy and choose Design It Yourself gift baskets? Whether it's a gift for that special someone, family, friends, employees, corporate clients, you don't have to rack your brain anymore. These gift baskets are perfect for any person. At designityourselfgiftbaskets.com, gift baskets can be fully customizable, or you can choose hundreds of prearranged gift baskets. Design It Yourself gift baskets are festive for the holiday season, whether it's Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, and you can be sure that these beautifully decorated gift baskets will make anyone feel appreciated. No matter who you're shopping for, go to designityourselfgiftbaskets.com, And best of all, you get to save money. PAS Report listeners can get 10% off your order using code PAS at checkout. So go to DIYGB.com, find the perfect gift this holiday season, and use coupon code PAS at checkout to get 10% off today. Welcome to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. The PAS Report provides an honest analysis on the critical issues that matter to you without the biased media filters. Here's your host, Professor Nicholas Giordano. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Nick Giordano. And last week, I released an episode explaining how the Republican Party needs to change. It has to be flexible. It has to adapt. Most importantly, we need new leadership. In a day... We got our answer. A day after I released the episode, we got our answer. And the Republican elite has decided that the will of their constituents is irrelevant. Instead, they voted to maintain the stale leadership. And so McConnell remains the Republican leader in the Senate. McCarthy appears to be the next Speaker of the House. The only one who may go is Ronna McDaniel. Not for nothing. But out of everyone, I wanted to see McConnell go. He is someone I have come to loathe. And the reason why is because he remained silent when President Biden had the nerve to do a primetime address and label nearly half the country as fascist and a threat to the republic. He didn't say one thing to defend his own constituency, and that tells you everything you need to know about him. Senator McConnell and many of those who voted for him, it's they're completely out of touch with their own base. Imagine, this guy detests the people he represents. It is truly stunning. Now, on Wednesday, I'm going to speak about how out of touch with reality the bulk of the party is, so make sure that you tune into that episode. For today, I got Chadwick Moore stopping by. You probably read some of his work. You've seen him on Fox News. He just released a brand new book. So you've been to diversity training, smiling through the DEI apocalypse, and I want to get his thoughts and perspective on the bizarre world that we're living in. Chadwick knows the left very well. He used to be one of them. And he's a great person to talk to in order to understand how far the party has shifted. Before I jump in, make sure to hit the follow button so you never miss an episode. And if you find the content informative, please drop a review on Apple Podcasts. Also, don't forget to visit the PAS Report website, PASReport.com. With that out of the way, I want to bring in Chadwick Moore, author of So You've Been Sent to Diversity Training, Smiling Through the DEI Apocalypse. Great to have you on the program. I've been looking forward to this conversation. How are you, Chadwick? Hey, I'm doing great. Great to be on. Thanks for having me. I'm sure there's a lot of Americans out there who could relate to exactly what you talk about in this book. And and I have to ask, I mean, obviously, we've seen this push in a country towards insanity. But what was the trigger that made you decide to write this book? Well, you know, I was just having a conversation with someone, really. And, you know, they had said to me, you know, if if these, these magazines that used to do kind of great literary and journalism and kind of humor writing like The New Yorker or The Atlantic, if any of them still had any salt left to them, uh, someone would have done something about diversity training at work because it's like something that, you know, almost everyone has had to go through. It's so ridiculous. It's so uh, infantilizing. And it's just really ripe for not only mockery and, and humor that people can relate to, but also digging in deeper to, to, you know, see what's really going on, where it all started, what's behind this and what companies are up to, how it's become more woke and more insane over the last um, few years or decades. And uh, so I thought, yeah, well, you know, I write for one of these magazines. I'm going to do that. And then I realized, like, no, I think this is actually a book. So, um, so that's kind of how it came about. And um, and uh, yeah, it was um, it was really interesting and a lot of fun. You know, I talked to people from all over the country, from all walks of life, just asking, you know, what their experiences were. And um, it's you know, people at first would be they're very it, it's so mon- it almost, it's almost mundane now because so many people have to go through this. They would say like, you know, a lot of people would say. I'm not really sure why you're interested in this topic. You know, I don't think it's very interesting. And the more they would talk about it, the more they would remember things they had to go through or things they learned, or the more they'd pull up, you know, emails from their from their uh, diversity officer at work, the more they would be, be realize that this was a really kind of ridiculous and sinister 
thing that, that they were being forced to undergo and being subjected to that just seems so commonplace nowadays because we just kind of expect it in, in work environments. You know, we do. And it doesn't matter if you work for the public sector or the private sector. We see this going on all over the place. Now, I remember, you know, years ago, it used to be like sexual harassment training. That was like the main one that you did. And that was that. Now it's morphed into this whole thing about diversity. How did it start? You know, where, where did we see this big push, particularly in, in the private sector? Yeah, it's a great question. And so the way we think of it, diversity training now, it actually started in the U.S. military in around the civil rights era. And basically the military was worried that because of uh, what was happening in the country with racial relations, that there was going to be a problem with unit cohesion. So they launched these, they, they, they were working with people in academia to launch these diversity training initiatives between uh, black soldiers and white soldiers. And one of the things that they started doing for these things called um, encounter groups, where they basically sat down like a white service member and a black service member and kind of had them scream at each other for a while and tell them everything they didn't like about the other person's race thinking this would somehow lead them to come to some kind of understanding. What they actually found was it made people more racist. And so they stopped that immediately. And uh, but they still were looking into, you know, group cohesion. What's interesting now is, especially today, is the military is particularly one place where you really don't need this kind of training. Uh, you know, people are, tend to be more brothers in arms in the military. They don't really care about the uh, skin color or, or, gen or sexuality of the person next to them in the foxhole. Uh, but... Um, in the 70s, you know, the, the private companies, especially being inspired by academia, began to pick up on this diversity stuff. And you had the sexual revolution feminism. So that got roped into workplace training in the 80s and the 90s. They introduced the gay and lesbian uh, and sexual orientation to these trainings. And then in the 2000s, it's um, transgenderism, obviously, uh, but also then taking a huge step backwards in the 2000s and especially in recent years uh especially when i was writing this book during the summer of our uh, summer of george floyd that that uh the the message of cohesion and treating the golden rule to treat others as you would like to be treated is completely out the door and you have got this really evil ideology being taught in the workplace it's critical race theory this uh you know one race is responsible for all the ills of another race this anti-white hatred and, uh, and, and, and also, you know, we, we've entered a, a place where uh, people, especially millennials in the workforce, they kind of expect their job to be talking about things in the news while they're on the job. You know, they, they <laughs> come to expect uh, HR to send out headlines about January 6th and whatnot and, and coach people on how they're supposed to uh, uh, handle that at, at work and if they need to you know, go sit in the corner and cry for an hour or whatever. Uh, so it, it's a lot of um, a lot of this this stuff obviously comes from academia, but then you have an entire generation of the workforce that has grown up to expect certain things and that has grown up to, to view the, the country in a certain way that they want their job to talk about this stuff on company time. You know, it's amazing. It's like every single bad idea you could possibly think of comes out of academia and then filters throughout society and makes it even worse. That's exactly right. I agree with you there. Now, I've been in academia, so I see it on firsthand all the time. And when you look at it, it, it's like many of the people in academia have served their entire lives. They never left the college bubble, the higher education bubble, and their life revolves around theory. But theory does not translate into reality. So how damaging is this to our society? Well, we see the effects everywhere. You know, you look at studies that were that were conducted in, say, for example, like the 1990s, where there, there are lots of big studies uh, um, polls talking to black people about, you know, their feelings on racism in America. And in the 90s, uh, black, the black Americans felt there were less racism in the country than there is today. So how do you obviously there's not obviously things only keep getting better. Uh, but what, how do you explain that that change that, that a lot a huge part of the country thinks we're going back? Well, it's these ideas coming from academia and then, of course, uh, pumped out by the media and by Hollywood and, and God knows who else that uh, it's it's it, it, you know, people are being fed so many lies. Uh, and, and, you know, like in this book, I have a whole chapter on policing. I talked to, I went to a diversity training with the NYPD. I talked to cops in the NYPD. 
And, you know, one of the things that you never hear about policing, obviously, is one of the huge topics in, in critical race theory. Uh, when I was writing this book, it became a huge topic in, in workplaces for some strange reason. Workplaces had to talk about George Floyd and stuff like this. And uh, uh, but when you look at, you know, even Gallup did a poll of 30,000 black Americans and they found that 80 percent of them wanted policing to be conducted as it is today, meaning they wanted the same number of police officers or more police officers in their neighborhoods. Well, you would never get that fact if you were just watching CNN or MSNBC or reading the New York Times. They're trying to convince you that all of Black America thinks that, you know, cops are hunting them for sport and they don't want them anywhere near them, which obviously is not true. Black people want their communities to be policed and safe, just like every person in this country does. So these lies have real world consequences. They have consequences in elections, as we see, and just how people perceive their nation. But none of it is, is based on fact. It's, it's all done for political gain. And you're so right, because I look at it that where, you know, the new generations are actually the most least racist generations. They're the most tolerant generations. Like I know my generation wouldn't say one tenth of the things that my grandparents said. And yet we're treating them as if they're the most bigoted and intolerant generation to exist. Now, when we look at this, it is a money-making racket. And you do point this out in your book. Can you explain to the audience how much money we're talking about? This is a big business now. It is, yeah. It's the first Marxist revolutionary tactic that's also a private, that's also a business, it's an enterprise in its own, a capitalistic enterprise. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it is very, very big business. You know, companies have to spend untold amounts of money on these diversity czars if they have them in-house. You know, it's a, if you're a diversity czar at a big company, it's a, you get basically lifetime guaranteed employment for doing nothing of value and uh, guaranteed uh, uh, job security. Um, but then, of course, there's all these people out there that are just these kind of free agent diversity czars that are brought in and um, and they go from anywhere. You've got these kind of huge names in the industry. For example, people like Robin DiAngelo. She is a white woman who wrote the book called White Fragility. And, uh, you know, she charges $15,000 to do a virtual presentation. And in, in one instance that I found, like she won't even do a live one. She'll just send off a pre-recorded uh, 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 speech she has on file for $15,000. This is ridiculous. Um, I mean, those numbers can go up astronomically. You've got people like Ibram X. Kendi, who's another one of these Templars in this industry, uh, who is, you know, has grown up with all the privileges in the world. He's, he's a black man who talks about how racist America is and makes lots of money by, by uh, 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 trashing capitalism. And uh, he went to private schools. He has spent his entire life in academia and some of the, the, the most renowned institutions um, in our country, best-selling New York Times author on TV all the time. But of course, he's a victim of racism because why not? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he can charge $20,000 and up just to give an hour speech. Uh, and so it, it is a huge business. There's obviously no qualifications to, to um, grieve to a room full of strangers about, you know, bizarre theories on race in America. Uh, but uh, uh, they're, they're getting away with it. And, um, you know, a lot of these companies have these corporate retreats. Even where they, uh, there was one company that had a, something called a, um, uh, that I write about called um, White Men as Full Partners. And they, they invited only like white male employees to go on this retreat to discuss how horrible they are and what they can do to help everyone else. Because that's company. not racist uh, at all. <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. But as you were saying before, it's, the younger generations, of course, of course, less racist, but that's why they have to change the meaning of the words racism to basically mean anything. That's why they have to change what white supremacy means to not the way, uh, not the actual definition or what we think of a, a white supremacist being, but, but being something that basically is in every single aspect of our society. You know, it's, it's lurking in your cereal box. It's uh, walking down the street. It's, it's anywhere you look, there's white supremacy. Um, and it becomes this kind of maddening um, uh, 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 worldview they've created where it, the goal is always, the goalposts are always moving and uh, they, can main, they can maintain power and control that way because nothing they're saying is really based in fact, it's just amorphous um, uh, conspiracy theory that's floating around. And, and, and the fact that private companies are um, subjected to this and feel like they, they have to appease these forces it's pretty scary. It really has no place in, in your, at your job at all. Let's face it. In our busy lives, we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. In fact, according to the CDC, only 1 in 10 Americans are eating the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables each day. 
missing out on essential vitamins, minerals, fibers, and antioxidants. And that's where Balance of Nature comes in. Balance of Nature sources only the best produce, free from pesticides, heavy metals, and harmful bacteria. And Balance of Nature is the best fruit and vegetable product on the market. They use only fresh whole fruits and vegetables inside each capsule. They don't use any GMOs, fillers, binding agents, or preservatives of any kind. I would never endorse a product that I don't use myself. And since using Balance of Nature, I feel more alert. I have more energy. My focus is sharper and I feel great. Live life to the fullest and choose Balance of Nature. PAS Report listeners can get 35% off the first preferred order. Start getting the recommended daily amount of fruits and vegetables you need by using code PAS at balanceofnature.com. You have to admire the business model. If I could pre-record something and get $15,000 a pop for it, I, I would be a very happy man. Unfortunately, I can't do that. My market value isn't that high. And But seriously, <laughs> with the unending business model, you know, we were making real progress when it came to race. And if you do look at the polls, you'll see throughout the late 90s and very early in the 2000s, uh, most people didn't even, racism didn't even register on areas of concern. And then it exploded, you know, throughout the teens of the 2000s. But it's the never ending business model. See, if racism can is not a societal issue if racism is something that is a taught behavior well you could solve the problem of racism but if it's inherent from birth you always have a client list don't you yeah that's exactly right and, that, and that's a great way to put it and it, they have to keep perpetuating this it's a business it's not only a business model for so many of these people and a business model for so much of our our mainstream media but it's also a, a model to maintain power and votes for the left they you know they absolutely Need this. It, it, you know, every day people look around them and they don't, it doesn't matter your skin color or your sexuality or whatever. They look around them and they see a normal people, not wacky activists. They see a nation of, 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 of good, kind people who are a very diverse nation and everyone treats each other mostly with respect. And, you know, I think Americans are inherently good people. Everything is constantly getting better in this country. Uh, uh, where these issues are concerned, but then you tune into the fictions of media and academia, and it's the exact opposite. So they're asking you to not believe what is is uh, right in front of your face. You know, they're they're and they're winning in a lot of ways. They're asking you not to believe what you know to be true and what you see with your own eyes and ears out in the real world. Well, explain that a little bit because I think that that's really important that you do say that they're winning in a lot of ways. I, explain that for a minute. I think that if it's uh, for whatever reason that people need to believe these fictions and, and it, perhaps it gives themselves some sort of, some sort of um, um, meaning in life. Uh, but if you just look at, at, at the, um, uh, the last couple of elections where they're, they're banking their strategy on race, especially the last election in 2020. Um, and, it, it, and, you know, for a lot of us, we thought we saw those, those George Floyd riots and Antifa riots that, well, nobody's going to vote for this stuff. They're going to look at how crazy the left is and want a return to normalcy. And yet, somehow it, it worked for them. Um, and it's, it, it still remains a huge business. I mean, it, and also look at what's happened with just in culture, like comedy. How, uh, we are seeing a, a kind of backlash against, you know, woke comedy. Uh, we see a lot of comedians emerging now. We're getting big Netflix deals and whatnot who do make jokes about race, who make jokes about sexuality. And because it's funny, you know, average people um, want to hear this stuff because we like to be able to make fun of each other. Um, and so the woke schools are retreating a bit, but it, it's it's amazing to see how successful they have been and, and continue to be. Yeah, I, I agree with that. They they have been successful to a large degree. And at the same time, as you pointed out, a lot of the people involved in this, th these are not people that were born into poverty and had to work their way up through society. Th these were people that actually were born into pretty good families. But if you listen to them, you would think like, Every single black person is poor. Every single Hispanic person illegally came into the United States and is poor. Like, like they ascribe like the worst in, in their own cultures, yet that's not reality. 80% of, of blacks are actually in the middle class. And I don't know about you, but I do speak with black Americans just like, you know, because we're all part of the same team here in the United States. And I find that when it comes to giving speeches in black audiences, one of the questions I'll ask them is how many Klansmen they've encountered in their neighborhoods. And the answer is always zero. <laughs> Do you find that too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I think that you're exactly right. And, and back to your other question about how they've been successful. They've been, they've been so successful in having us essentially only talk about race. When, as you had mentioned, the people who are pushing this stuff 
are the most privileged, usually white liberals. And if they're not, if their skin color isn't white, they're culturally white. White. They're people like Ibram X. Kendi, who's culturally a white person, and who might have dark skin. But these, it's these, it's it's the sort of first uh, uh, revolution, if you will, that is the elites punching down. It's not the bottom punching up. It's the top punching down. And while they have us focused on particularly skin color, and while that dominates all of the headlines and here we are talking about it here i wrote a big part of my book about it what we're not talking about is what you mentioned it's class basically and you know the fact that the kind of um the kind of uh middle american ex-democrat trump voter who voted on free trade who voted on immigration um that is voting against free trade policies and, and what's happening with immigration the kind of the people who've been subjected to these policies that bombed out the middle of the country and have decimated our communities they have just as much in common with the people who are struggling in the inner cities. These are the kind of people that that are actually have legit grievances and should be coming together. But uh, the powers that be can keep us separated by saying, well, these people are white and these people are black, and therefore one group is hurting the other. When really both groups are being hurt by the same system. And that's what's most uh, damaging. And that's what's kept. Uh, that's how they've been most successful. And I love how you just framed it, that it is a socioeconomic thing, because, I mean, most people, if you listen to these fools, wouldn't know about Appalachia and the poor white communities that exist over there. Uh, and instead, they focus only on the urban centers. But when we do look at it, it does come down to socioeconomic status and, and many people being left behind by the elitist attitude. And do you think that while they were winning, do you think they overstepped their bounds and they pushed a little too far because when we're looking at the polling, we're seeing uh, Hispanics now moving towards Republicans. We're seeing blacks, particularly black males now moving towards Republican people like yourself have been pretty much banned from the Democrat Party and from the progressive agenda uh, because you dare to speak out. Do you think that people have had enough? Uh, I mean, I hope so. You know, but I thought that it was it, it, the, the the case with them. Um... Yeah, Hispanic voting voters moving to the right and black men vote, moving to the right is very encouraging. But also we're looking at a time when the issues are very, very specific. So whether or not the white would be able to hold on to those that vo- those voters and those voting blocks is up, is to be decided. You know, now we're everyone appears to be voting on kitchen table issues. It's inflation, it's gas prices, um, it's uh, uh, immigration, things like so that. So what you're um, telling me is that blacks, Hispanics, whites and Asians that regardless of our skin color, we actually care about pretty much the same major issues. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting, isn't that? A very dangerous thing to say and very interesting indeed. <laughs> it is. And that's the thing. So I look at these people and I try to, you know, I try to understand them. I try and get into their mind frame to see what the agenda is and to wake people up, because one of the things, as someone that's in academia, our schools, our education system has completely collapsed. It's it's an abysmal failure. But one of the most amazing parts was during the coronavirus, how if you attended school in an urban area, which is much more likely to be minority, the reality is that those schools actually closed for nearly two years. And they actually put an enormous pressure and burdens on the family units in those communities. And they increased the academic achievement gaps uh, beyond something that's going to take decades to try and figure out. So the same people that claim to care uh, about minorities, claim to care about giving them a voice and ending racism, are also the same ones that have created policies that are disastrous to these communities, are they not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was one of the huge issues because I used to be a, you know, I used to vote Democrat. I've always been a civil libertarian. You know, I've always been a kind of my politics are leave me the hell alone and I'll leave you the hell alone kind of sums it up. But, you know, before Trump came along, I always voted Democrat. And one of the huge things that woke me up to that was I just started thinking about blue cities uh, with one party rule, like where I live in New York, that nothing ever gets better for these poor communities that the Democrats um, uh, pretend to care about. And the more I started thinking about it, the more I started reading about it and waking up to it, that was a huge, a huge eye opener for me when I, you know, saw that it was, um, that, that, that it's not even that they don't, don't bother to help them, it's that their policies actively w- work to keep these communities under their thumb and powerless and poor and, and addicted to voting for handouts and, and whatever else, and addicted also to just 
um, fluffy rhetoric about justice and racism and equality that means absolutely nothing. And they don't back any policies that, that, uh, that work towards those goals. Uh, in fact, the policies uh, that, that even the ones who, the, the true believers in the Democrat Party, the Bernie Sanders and whatnot, the, the true believers in socialism, uh, you know, I, I just started thinking, looking into more what that meant, because I just never really thought too much about it. I was, when I was younger, I was too um, enamored by the kind of fluffy high rhetoric and believing that the other team was worse. Now, so I don't know, you know, I just, I still think because I, I spent so much of my life in, in communities that vote in a block to the left, that I think, you know, it's hard to see that sea change coming. I think there's a lot of fear. And also for now, what we see is too many people just uh, consider, you know, uh, that part of their identity and they want to vote how their neighbors are voting. And if their neighbors say vote Democrat and their family members say, say vote Democrat, they'll do it no matter how, how uh, much worse it makes their life. Even though a lot of these communities have absolutely nothing to lose because the Democrats have done absolutely nothing for them. They'll continue to vote for Democrats because they're worried about social ostracization. Um, that's, you know, what I see a lot in New York and that's what I see a lot in my own communities, um, which is sad. But, you know, as you mentioned before, we're seeing sections of these groups that are that are breaking with the trend and, and whether that's just um, – for this election cycle or not, it's, it's yet to be seen. Yeah, and Republicans don't necessarily always have the best of messaging, that's for sure, because I, I was right. talking with someone the other day and talking about the failures in the education system, and then they were like, well, that's because the conservatives have destroyed the education system. And I'm like, wait, the left's been in charge of academia for the last 100 years. I mean, it's not like conservatives yeah. can play a role <laughs> in academia, so you really can't blame us. Same thing in New York State. I'm from New York State. This state has been under Democrat rule and a supermajority since 2018, but Democrat rule for a lot longer than that. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse. So how do we fix this problem? In your book, you talk that there is a way out. I mean, it takes a lot of, you know, people getting involved, being aware of what's really going on. How do you penetrate all the noise and the narrative? Because that's where the Democrat strength is, that they get to control the narrative. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. And, and even with um, what, what you're just saying, about, yeah, the Republicans do have a problem with messaging. In fact, the, the last Republican presidential candidate to really make a pitch for blue cities was Ronald Reagan. And he would actually travel to the, the inner city. He was in the Bronx, you know, meeting with people and, and wanted those photo ops and uh, met with editors of, of, uh, of black magazines and Jet. Uh, Republicans nationally haven't really done that at all since him. It's really encouraging to see Lee Zeldin um, he, I don't believe he did really at the, at the start of his campaign, but he certainly um, has since then going into Puerto Rican areas in New York City, into Dominican areas in New York City and making pitch to those voters. It's very powerful. More, more Republicans should absolutely do that uh, because a lot of these groups realize um, that the left is full of crap, but they feel like they just have to vote for the left because that's what they do. Um, but, you know, yeah, in, in my book, I kind of I kind of bring up the example of the Soviet Union and, and, and when the Berlin Wall came down, how uh, you, you read a bunch of reports at the time of all these people who um, they were so astounded by watching all of their friends and families and neighbors and, and coworkers flood into the West. And these are people who just hours before were repeating party, Soviet party lines, word for word, and pretending like they were good little communists. But secretly, they had people realizing that everyone around them felt the same way they did. They just wouldn't publicly express those feelings. And so there was a, a massive um, a cascade uh, uh, in, in uh, East Berlin at that time of people realizing that everything had been an illusion. And, you know, you sort of see that a lot, especially with what's going on with, I use the example for, you know, DEI training and this kind of uh, stuff that's forced upon us that people are not comfortable saying out loud. Uh, they're not comfortable telling pollsters or journalists or many others, especially in this example in their, in their workplace, how they really feel about that stuff. But, um, but often they realize that something may happen when they realize that everyone has quietly been on the same page. And, um, and that's encouraging, you know, to, to know that, um, that a lot of it's just um, an illusion that, uh, that people are, are onto the scam. And it's so important for people to realize that, particularly in the United States, because we're the only country in the world where you have all these different peoples from all these different places that come together and actually coexist well together. You don't find that in any other country. So it's dangerous when you get this push to divide us into factions. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a country like Afghanistan where we're constantly in a civil war with each other, with the different groups that exist. 
you know, so I think your book is really important and, and it's out at such an important time in American history. And I want to thank you for the work that you do. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So I'd love to have you back on. As far as the country goes, where do you see this headed? Do you think in 2024, we're going to start to see a little bit more changes in 2022? I don't know. You know, I'm terrible at predicting these things. I was I was wrong about Trump winning the first time and wrong about him losing the second time. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm bad to see around the corner that comes with the, the poll numbers. Um, but uh, 2024 will certainly be interesting. I mean, what's going to be most interesting is how the Democrats handle their Biden and Kamala problem. You know, it, as we're seeing now, it looks like um, you see the liberal media are throwing Biden under the bus left and right right now. The Washington Post just gave him um, a, what they call a bottomless Pinocchio rating about his, his see that. lies and some speeches. Yeah. So um, I think that's going to be most interesting to see is how they're going to handle that problem. Obviously, Biden is, is incompetent and demented and, and can't uh, run again. Uh, and nobody wants Kamala. So <laughs> what is the party going to do? That's That's going to be interesting. It certainly is. I'm actually looking forward to it. Chadwick, I want to thank you for joining me on the PAS report. I encourage everyone to get your book and we're going to have links up at the website. Awesome. Thank you. My pleasure. I had fun with that conversation. And Chadwick seems like a great person down to earth. Make sure to check out his book. So you've been to diversity training. Give him a follow up. The link's up at the PAS report website, PASreport.com. So check it out. Don't forget to tune in on Wednesday. It's going to be an eye opening episode. And the Republican Party needs to get their act together. I'll explain more then. As always, please share this episode with family, friends, and on social media. If you find the podcast informative, please give the PAS Report a five-star rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts. I want to thank you for joining me, and I'll be back on Wednesday with another great episode of your PAS Report podcast. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. Podcast. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe to the podcast. So you'll never miss an episode. Also, visit PASReport.com and follow us on Twitter at PASReport.